Great. All right. Well, welcome everyone um, to this webinar presented by the Woodlands Partnership of Northwest Massachusetts. Um, the Education Outreach and Research Committee of the Partnership is pleased to host this event on the topic, Waste or Resource, a panel discussion on wood residue. And I'll introduce our speaker shortly. But first, um, it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge we are learning, speaking, working, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican, Pakumtuk, and Abenaki people, and the Nipmuc people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So my name is Lisa Hayden, and I'm Outreach Manager for New England Forestry Foundation, a nonprofit regional land trust focused on conserving forests and advancing exemplary forestry to help sustain people, protect wildlife habitat, and respond to climate change. And I'm hosting today in my liaison role as administrative agent for the Woodlands Partnership of Northwest Massachusetts. And this is a consortium serving our most forested corner of the Commonwealth. This organization was formerly known as the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership with the board adopting its new name last fall. And if you're not familiar, the mission of the partnership is threefold. First, promoting conservation of the diverse forests of this 21 town region in Northern Berkshire and Western Franklin counties and supporting their ecosystem function amid a changing climate. Second, supporting natural resource-based and sustainable economic development for the region. And third, advocating for the municipalities of this very rural area and maintaining services for their local communities. Um, also assisting from NEF today is partnership assistant, Sophie Argett Singer, who's um, hosting the Zoom, and Kate Lindros Conlin, chair of the outreach committee. And thanks for all their help. And also Henry Art, board chair of the partnership will be moderating, moderating the panel discussion today. Um, and um, actually, Kate, I see a note from Andre. So if you can help him to join, that would be great. Okay. And so in terms of logistics, we have a, a rather large group today. So attendees will be muted during the panel presentations, but we welcome your questions or comments in the chat box. And also the webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing a link in a follow-up email. Okay, so our speakers today include Ben Cargare, a Williams College student who conducted a study of the amount of wood residue generated from the Woodlands Partnership Municipalities. And Ben is going to review findings from his summer research project. Next, we will welcome Andre Gaines Roberson Jr. Strong Bearheart, a citizen of the Nipmuc people and a traditional artist and cultural steward who works with the Okateo Center in Ashfield. His work focuses on bringing traditional knowledge back to indigenous peoples. And he is also creative director of No Loose Braids. Third, we will have Sean Mahoney, director of wood utilization and forester for the Department of Conservation and Recreation, who will be touching on wood banks around the Commonwealth. Then we'll have Jay, Jay Healy, former state commissioner of agriculture, a partnership board member and owner of Hall Tavern Farm in Charlemont, who will share his views from experience operating a local sawmill. And our panel will close out with Emily Boss, executive director of Massachusetts Woodlands Institute, a nonprofit affiliate of Franklin Land Trust uh, that assists landowners in responsibly managing their woodlands and also helps people to find local wood products through the Western Mass Woods online directory and marketplace. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining today. And I think we will kick it off first with, um, with Ben. Uh, if you want to share your screen, I think you have some slides, right? Um, let's see. Hi everyone. Um, so I took a look at wood waste in the the Woodlands Partnership region last summer. Um, so so at least for categorizing wood waste and you know how do we define it? So I, it was material consisting of you know trees. I, I excluded stumps and brush in my project, um, but we can discuss them as well. Um, so it's often wood chips, shaving, bark, um, and, and it comes from from two main 
areas. Um, this will change some, sometimes urbans and forest are referred to different things, but at least for, for my uses, I, I call them forest and then urban. So forest, having forest management um, and sawmill byproducts, and then urban, we have a lot of arbor culture. So um, roadway maintenance, electrical line maintenance, tree removal and trimming, and like land clearing. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. So what kind of forms does it take and what do we, what is wood waste um, or waste wood? Um, so because it has to go somewhere in the definition, um, you know, it, it can't be left in place. Um, it can be, so it, it starts out as often as, as, you know, anything we, I mean, I excluded stumps, but, you know, board wood, cord wood and chip and, and then uh, like leaves and twigs. Um, so in many cases, it, it, it varies by the source. Um, but in, in most cases, when, when something has to be removed, um, it, it, it becomes wood chips um, because that's the easiest to dispose of it. It's, it's the most compact um, way to, to, to move um, wood. Um, and if you have to remove it, then it make, just makes sense to chip it. Um, and, and because of that, you have a large variation in quality uh, of the wood chips. You know, what kind of tree did it come from? How many of how much bark is in the in are in the wood chips? Um, what size are the wood chips? Uh, how much? How many leaves? It, it, a lot of factors that that really determine the quality of the wood chips. They're not are going to work for every use um, or way you want to use the wood chip. Um, even some some arbor culture. Folks will will even might you know some trash might find its way into the wood the wood pile, um, so it's not the variation can also can vary by source uh, the 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 quality of the wood chips can vary by source, um, and and from for a variety of factors. Um, so at least for our forest sources, we have I considered a few different sources. So we have invasive species removal and prescribed fire, which is it's not a huge, I mean, we only have one or one case that I've heard about um, that's on Bullock Ledge in Williamstown um, where, you know, we white pine had to be removed um, for wildlife management, um, you know, trying to get invasive species uh, out in different species compositions. Um, or if you had prescribed fire, you might want to remove brush. So that's something that might, might increase in the future. Uh, where material actually has to be removed from the woods. Um, we also have wood uh, wood waste coming from sawmill byproducts. So it has to go somewhere um, because maybe it's sawdust or or, um, or like remove bark. Um, so that, again, the, the quality will change. Um, and we're not really finding that any kind of timber harvesting or any anything to remove material from the woods for money is is happening in 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 our area um that's probably a good thing um that's because you know we have such steep sides uh to the we have such topography here um it's not fe economically feasible and uh i mean not that we would want to do it but um because it it really is not material that we have to 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 um to it can just it can be left in place generally. So maybe in Eastern Mass, they're doing a lot of biomass removal of like softwoods. Um, that's not really waste wood, and that's also not what we're finding here is it really contributing to anything. <clears throat> and then for urban sources, uh, generally considered a little bit of a little bit of land clearing. So um, Panamail and I believe well, I'm gonna mess this up. Maybe Ashfield, um, and I discussed with them, and then so they have some. They're generating a little bit, and that's different from most other of the urban sources, and that it's that's coming from a, a given area, so um, it's not a, you know a dispersed source. Um, so that's generating a little bit. They're they're really composting a lot of that those wood chips, um, but then the really I mean, of all of the sources we've considered, I considered. Um, arbor culture, so like roadway power line maintenance, transmission lines, um, like clearing 
parks and and um, just tree trees as they impact the urban uh, urban environment or you know urban as as in what what we have for urban areas um, and then a large a, a source within that um, that can that's really important to consider is our storms and emergency response um, because this is when a large volume of of downed wood um, you know will will that's when you get a huge volume. Um, I discussed with, uh, after I had written the report, I got in, I spoke to, I believe, Greg Cox uh, in Holly. Could be wrong. Um, but, you know, after a windstorm, uh, you're getting just an enormous volume of downed wood that has to go somewhere. Um, and because it's, you know, just such a volume and you have to move it somewhere, it's all becoming wood chips. Um, so, so that's, those are the kind of arboriculture as the, the main source. Um, you have also transmission lines. So there's big, big power lines that transport, uh, power, um, those in certain situations, when you trim them, um, you can't just leave the, the wood chips in where they are, uh, because of maybe of invasive species, um, or not invasive species, but, you know, species you might want to conserve. There's little scrub scrubs on un, under the, the the transmission lines, so you have to move the wood chips, um, and those can also generate a huge volume. Um, it's really tough to track down, you know, how, actually how much is being produced though, uh, for any of these sources. Uh, so for any of the arbor culture, so that's something that we can we can definitely take a look into. We should definitely take a look into more if there are some new uses that we can we can think of, um, or that might might make sense. It would make sense really to look at arboriculture as a main, you know, source of this volume and of stuff that has to has to go somewhere. So as far as current uses, so generally for for cordwood, uh, Sean will 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 definitely add a lot to this. But you know, wood banks would make sense um, as far as you know, boardwood or really like nice stuff before it gets chipped. Um, that would be that's definitely what uh, what what think that what wood banks make sense for. Um, but then if it's already become a wood chip because it has to go somewhere and you can't find a local use, so a local homeowner maybe to take the wood or, or to use the wood chips um, and it has to be to be driven somewhere. Um, the uses that we're seeing are really ar arborists and you know depending on this, this the source uh, obviously um, are turning it into finding ways to, to have it become you know, plant or animal bedding um, is being used in farms. It's being as added to compost, um, so as a source of of carbon for the compost. Um, so, so these are all great uses, but we're trying to think of of new potential uses um, that can make use of this wood. So, obviously, everyone's going to be looking for sequestration. Um, so, generally, when the when the wood decomposes. It releases that carbon that it's that's stored in the wood chips um, back into the atmosphere. So we want to keep the carbon, you know, in the wood chips um, or sequester the carbon so it doesn't go back in the atmosphere. Um, so we've looked maybe at wood fiber insulation or different kinds of engineered wood products that could work for sequestration. And it's really unlikely that these are going to work for most of the volume that we're seeing. So certainly for, for cordwood or, or not, or, you know, nicer wood, boardwood from down trees, it, that might be a sequestration, but for the most of the volume that we're seeing in the form of wood chips, sequestration just isn't going to happen because the, the wood, the quality of the chips are too small. They're from mixed species, from random species. They're not, um, obviously they're from these huge spatial areas. So if you wanted to have any central facility, it would be really tough to get everything there and it wouldn't really make sense. Um, and then you might just the quality, you might have trash and the wood chips. So for anything like that, it's, it might be tough. Um, obviously you can do some steps to maybe increase the, the quality of the wood chips. Uh, that's certainly going to be tough. Um, so then also compost. So maybe that would be another use. Um, so perhaps if we could find ways to keep the carbon of the wood chips in the soil um, through compost, um, 
with farms. Uh, I talked spoke to Dick and Crane, and and that seems like like a you know somewhat feasible. Um, it's not really economically viable though. So there's that. Um, and that you know, sorry, the the Husig Water Quality District, for example, which they they compost uh, municipal solid waste. That's not something that's really on the up and up with PCBs. So that's probably not a few good features. And they don't even use kind of arborist wood chips, so wood waste. They use like specialty wood chips um, because the the wood chips that are coming from arbor culture or anything that's really trying to, that's really categorized as wood waste is not a good quality, right? It's got stuff in it. It's not, it's just mixed species. It's tons of bark. It's, it's um, two small chips or, you know, they're, they're really stringy chips. Um, so ultimately, one, one of the uses that I, I found that was the most promising, um, it's also probably the most controversial, um, it is the most controversial, is, is heating. So this is really only certain applications, right? So I'm not saying wood pellets. I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying a lot of things, really. So this really makes sense because... For green wood chips, the wood chips coming from arbor culture, if you can just kind of sift them a little bit to make sure they're all like not too much, much bark. Um, and then it makes sense for maybe large buildings like hospitals or schools um, where you have, can have such a, a big, um, a, like a large, I believe like a furnace, a large, like a large enough maw that it's not getting too much of the the ash or like little bits of sand that are in the in the bark. It's not clogging, getting clogged up. Um, and then you're only doing it for base loads. So because you have green wood chips and it takes energy and time and really you lose a lot of the, 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 the carbon saving. Um, if you want to process the wood and kind of dry it out so it releases less pollutants. Um, so it releases, you know, fewer pollutants when you burn it. Um, it makes sense more for base load for heating for these hospitals, right? So for base load, you could always run it super, super hot so that the pollutants, the wood would always, the green wood chips would always be burnt as completely as possible, um, removing a lot of the, moving the pollutants from, you know, semi-combusted or if it's not, you know, fully um, hot enough. So it would always be running super hot. Um, you could throw the, the green wood chips in a large enough furnace um, that's not getting clogged up. Um, and that might make sense for a heating use. Obviously, that needs to come with a lot more, you know, science um, behind the the pollutants. Um, we have to consider that oil itself is a carcin or has a lot of you know pollutants associated with it. So it's not that we're going necessarily from, you know, we're not comparing like oil or electricity as perfect because you know electricity itself comes from a you know, in, this, in our state comes from a large amount of trash burning. Um, so it's not pretty either. Um, but we can might we might want to have more uh, science behind the the baseload heating applications. Um, Charlie Carey uh, sold a lot of these these kind of burners. Um, so that that might be something. Um, and the the state incentives really need to 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 get better um, for this kind of application, right? So I'm not advocating for burning wood, um, but I'm saying, you know, if we're gonna burn wood, we might as well do it better. Um, so we might as well do it with with better, um, better, better furnaces, better, so, so better ways to remove the pollutants um, so that we can get use of this, these wood chips before they release the carbon anyway. Um, so we're really offsetting. Um, electricity and oil with wood chips that would be releasing the carbon um, that's stored in them anyway. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Ben. And next up um, is Andre. So thank you very much for joining Andre. And um, we're gonna have about 10 minutes for each of our other speakers before we open it up to questions and discussion, so. <clears throat> thank you. Well, thank you. Motop and Wani Natasawas Manikisu Mosmata Manitou Katabana Mishio Kisapakonigan. Good morning. My name is Andre Strong Bearheart from the Nipmuc people. Uh, let me make sure I'm off mute here. 
Yeah, there's a lot that comes to mind when we uh, start thinking about what we're talking about here. Kind of makes me spin a little bit because um, first off, we're talking about wood residues and wood as waste. And, you know, the relationship of, of my people and the people of this land is that when even if a tree comes down, it's still relative to us. And so it couldn't possibly be waste. Like that word waste kind of makes me spin a little bit because what about when a person crosses over? And we've been using this type of terminology about um, uh, for some reason, everybody's picture uh, went blank. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, I, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, so when it comes to like people being waste, that's not reality uh, to my people. There's a relationship to um, who we are here in the land itself. And so I think right off the rip, uh, when it comes to this conversation, I want to think about these relatives. When these relatives have to have their lives taken, what does that mean to us as Nipmuc or Indigenous peoples here, um, rather than um, the way that it's been going here for the past couple hundred years. And um, quite honestly, um, we traditionally groomed our forests in ways that um, were amazing. We utilized all our deadwood. We utilized a lot of the trees that were, obviously the, the landscapes were much different. There was a different um, environment before the, the clear cuts. But um, even in today's day and age, us still being here, us still being present, there's so many ways that we can still utilize uh, what scientists and people in today's society call waste um, for our people, what we call it as relatives to be able to honor that in good ways. And so some of these ways are, um, I know that I've been reaching out to Eversource and um, there's like a, a, a field botanist woman who um they've been taking down a lot of ash ash trees because of the um emerald ash borer and so uh ash trees is one of the is one of the um trees that we use to harvest the bark to um cover our traditional wheat twos like this one behind me this is a cedar pole wheat two um these are the ways we built our traditional homes and we cover them with ash bark or poplar bark um Traditionally, also, we would have used elm and um, different types of barks that aren't here that we can't really use anymore. But, um, yeah, it's tough. Like, I, I drive by these spots, I drive by these places, and as a culture steward, uh, it's tough when it comes to um, the, the amount of cuts that I see just because um, there's a wire. There's a, there's a wire there. And... Um, Oh, sorry, I'm seeing a lot of questions pop up. Um, so when I see these, when I see this wood on the side of the roads, um, there's a lot of things that it can be utilized for. First off, we have a lot of uh, local indigenous um, peoples who, like myself, uh, No Loose Braids is a nonprofit organization. We have the Okateu Cultural Center. We have Eastern Woodland Rematriation. We have the Nipmuc Cultural uh, preservation Incorporation and the uh, Nipmuc Farm School. That's just to name a few that um, we would utilize these fallen trees. We would utilize them for making things like traditional ash splint baskets or for harvesting and uh, utilizing the bark to cover our homes, um, using these dead poles to be able to mill into um, different types of lumber to be able to build tiny homes and things for our peoples. Like, I wonder why it is that, um, and I just saw like wood smoke too. We're talking a lot about wood smoke, but let me share something, uh, you know, when it comes to smoking uh, wood smoke, though, so these stumps and this brush and things like that, depending on when we let it um, decompose a bit, we utilize this, we would have utilized this wood for smoking our, our skins, you know? And so in today's day and age, uh, we're not going to go and uh, it's crazy the way that hunters hunt and the way that the amount of deer skins and uh, that population gets thrown away. 
Um, all these things correlate, like, so we could utilize all this stump and all this um, dead wood to be able to smoke our skins in a way that we need to. Um, but getting back to all of the, the um, organizations that I just spoke of, these indigenous organizations, I wonder why it is that we're not on these forestry management plans or why we're not on these first end calls when it comes to a cut on the side of the road or um, why it is that if we stewarded the land for 10,000 years here, why we're not at these types of conversations, which I appreciate that I'm at today. So thank you for that invite. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's tough. We have a relationship to the land in which a lot of our peoples, uh, many scientists do not agree with you. Oh, I'm talking to John, sorry. I get easily distracted by the chats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I heard somebody just talking about some white pines also. Uh, white pines, when these trees come down, we utilize them to burn them out and turn into our traditional boats, which we call machines. They're dugout trees, you know? And so um, there's so many ways that we can utilize a lot of this quote unquote waste um, to honor it, you know? Um, when it comes to wood chips, we have a farm school. We could definitely um, utilize those wood chips for, in our farming. Um, I'm just curious why it is that um, that these questions aren't being asked to the local indigenous peoples. And I just want to make that an, an option and an opportunity uh, right now for folks to be able to reach out to us, to be able to help, um, because I'm hearing already this morning you know, you're trying to figure out more ways to what to do with the waste. And I have lots of ways and things that we could do with this quote unquote waste and to be able to deal with it in a good way. And so, um, you know, I was just up at Wheat Pumps not too long ago, which they call Mount Tom now, um, and which is over near South Deerfield, uh, over in that area. And yeah, just driving up the mountains and seeing, you know, these 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 trees laying down. Um, I wonder where a lot of these these trees, these cut trees from the from the power lines and um, these people and places that take these trees down, where they go. You know, I've seen some of the biggest ash that I've seen not too long ago um, cut down because of the power lines. And I was like, man, if we were only just part of this conversation, because we only have about a week to be able to peel this bark off before it turns into waste. So it's like, we have to be at these conversations because time is of the essence when these cuts happen for us to utilize them in ways that we need to do. And so it's like, hey, we're creating more waste, but we could have actually utilized that for something else. And um, yeah, so I just really wanted to touch on the fact that these relatives are not waste to us. They never have been. Um, they've been relatives to us. And in fact, each one of them have their own story about how they uh, play a part and a role in our lives here as indigenous people, as an Ipmuk person. Uh, I know that pine tree is so very important to us, you know, and I just heard that a minute ago that it needed to be taken down and it needed to be removed. And, you know, and I think about these things, you know, I think about, you know, as we stewarded the land for 10,000 years, um, there was health here. And I think about the way the land looks right now when it comes to our cold river streams and our vernal pools and uh, the carbon emissions and just amount of a few hundred years of colonization. And so we really need to get back into a balance um, in ways that, you know, we were able to think outside of the box rather than the rules, the regulations, the bureaucracy. We need to be able to bring indigenous people to the front line and be able to um, utilize our minds in ways that um, we have here for thousands of years. And so it's just important. Um, maybe one other thing I wanted to touch on so that I don't take too much more time here is um, in removing this waste, something that's really important to me is how it's being removed and what's on the ground there. Because um, some of the work that I do is cultural inventory reports and cultural uh, monitoring. And it's really important that we're not destroying the, the ground medicines, 
of our people is when removing this waste too. So it's like, um, it all plays a part in um, having us at this discussion, having us at the, the forefront of a planning operation. But yeah, it really kills me every time I drive by hundreds of trees that are just laying on the side of the um, road that quite honestly, we could have utilized a lot of different ways without us having um, uh, at these conversations. You know, I've been dealing with DCR at Douglas State Forest, and that's been a really difficult time myself because, uh, you know, given the rules and regulations when it comes to um, the bureaucracy of the way that um, cedar swamps get handled, it's incorrect. It needs to be changed because these cedar swamps are full with dead cedar all over the ground, all over the base of that cedar swamp in Douglas. And, um, and quite honestly, the, the gates are being locked in. And so that's gatekeeping in 2023. And that's still part of assimilation, if you ask me. And so we need to change these rules and regulations in the ways that we're able to harvest these things because the dead, the cedar, uh, we, could, we could eliminate out of that swamp and more youth could grow. But when you look into a community of a cedar swamp and you only see older cedars, um, that's sad. That's like looking into a community of people and only seeing elders. Where's the future in that? There's no future if you don't see any youth. And so, um, you know, I dealt with DCR there and uh, the park and they were saying that we could not um, harvest out of there because of the rules and the ways that they have things set up. But, you know, we have executive order 126 out of 1978, we can hunt, gather, and um, and do what we need to do in the ways that we have here for thousands of years. And so uh, we know as indigenous people, it's our job to be able to go into these spaces and create health. And so when I walk into a cedar swamp, which I've scoped six in the past year in Nipmuc territory, and only two were even able to be able to grab poles that were um, healthy enough as this to be able to build a home like this, that's sad. And so these people who are stewarding the land now really need to sit and have a conversation with us about what actually looks healthy, because I'm curious about their perception about what health is. So if you think it looks healthy to see lots of old cedar trees, but you see zero, very little uh, youth, young cedar, then, you know, my, my question is, we need to go back to the drawing board about who is stewarding these lands and why they're stewarding them. Um, and why it is that they hold a title that um, they don't know federal treaties or they don't understand when it comes to um, indigenous rights. Uh, that's another thing that needs to be at our forefront when it comes to harvesting. Uh, we hear about private property and, and um, these trees coming down on people's lands and things like that. And it's like, well, what are you talking about? You're talking about a couple, I mean, let's go back to the original deeds. We're talking about the 16th century deeds when Mashalik's land got passed through 10 uh, beaver pelts because she was trying to stop the health of her brother or, you know. So when we get into the real truths of what happened where and why, um, it's really important that our people are at these conversations because it hits home for us. And um, I'll just share that much. We could, I could talk a bunch more, but I want to save time for people. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, okay, and so our next um, panelist will be Sean Mahoney from DCR, and uh, go ahead, Sean, you have about 10 minutes or so. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Sean Mahoney. I am uh, the Director of Wood Utilization for DCR, um, and that is uh, a, a fun role to be in um, because a lot of what I do is help communities uh, use the resource that's around them. And um, I think I was asked here today to talk about uh, how, how best do we use force to um, provide public benefits to communities. Um, and work that I've been involved with since about 2014 has been uh, helping uh, ta mostly towns, some nonprofits uh, start uh, what we call a wood bank. Um, and for those that um, haven't heard the term before what a wood bank is, is it's, it's a place and a collection of people um, that, that convert uh, the resource, the forest that we have around us and um, the surplus that comes from that into 
uh, fuel assistance uh, in the form of firewood um, that goes back out into the community and keeps people warm through the winter. Um, many of our neighbors are struggling with what we call energy poverty or fuel insecurity. Um, and so uh, a wood bank is a great way to, to do something about that, that's grassroots. Um, and so I'm happy to explain uh, what, what these programs are. Um, we have wood banks right now operating in uh, four communities. Um, there's uh, one in Athol, Montague, uh, Petersham, uh, and one down in uh, the South County of the Berkshires that are uh, actively distributing wood. Uh, and then we have uh, a few more that are coming online this year in Buckland, Wendell, and Essex County. Um, so the wood banks are a place that, that they gather uh, wood in. Uh, we receive a lot of wood from the utility line clearings, uh, right-of-way work, um, not so much from forest management right now. Um, and then uh, in most cases, uh, volunteers in that community go in and process that wood and turn it into firewood. It gets dried and then distributed out um, in, in the winter time to people who need fuel assistance. Um, and why wood banks are, are really important, and I think a good opportunity to think about uh, for the Northern Berkshires is that it's a way to um, just better utilize the resource around us um, and understand that um, other fuel assistance programs that are out there can't solve the issue on their own. Um, folks have been reading the newspaper uh, I've been seeing that, you know, LIHEAP has had a little backlog. The Low Income Heating Assistance Program has had a little backlog with processing applications this year. And this is kind of, you know, wood banks work really at, at the local level. And so it's a way to kind of supplement what's going on with some of the federal assistance that's coming in. Um, they're about, uh, we did some, some work a number of years ago just to try to understand how many households are fuel insecure and can burn wood. Um, and across the state, we have between 2,500 and 6,500 households um, that are single family households um, that have a wood stove in them. Um, and a lot of that work was done based on a 2013 study uh, that NEF did that surveyed uh, households that received fuel assistance in Franklin County. So I just wanna give a shout out to NEF for for that great study, because it, it helped us understand how many households are out there. Um, now, how much wood does that look like? Um, well, from that, you know, understanding that demand and that need, um, you know, we're able to calculate that, you know, about 50 cords per community is what we need to, to solve, take a big strain off um, fuel insecurity for uh, our neighbors. Uh, so, you know, as wood banks come online and grow, the idea is we're kind of working towards that that 50 cord a year goal. Um, but, you know, with most wood banks, we start really small. We start with four cords or seven cords or 15 cords a year in each community with a group of people working on uh, splitting and processing that wood. Um, I wanna just um, let folks know that we have some, some assistance programs out there uh, to support community starting wood banks. Um, uh, we have a website, so my office, um, I take calls all the time from various communities wanting to start wood banks. Um, there is um, about, it's a, we have uh, grant opportunities with urban and community forestry challenge grants. So those are grants that come up in uh, October and with a filing and then in November for a full application. Um, and we can award up to $10,000 uh, to, to communities to, to start wood banks there. Um, and then uh, we also have um, a, a new grant program that came through the infrastructure bill. Um, so wood banks um, seem that they are a new concept, um, um, but uh, really there are about a hundred of them operating around the country. And so um, in the infrastructure bill, uh, the forest service was awarded funds from Congress to pilot uh, a new assistance program to support wood banks. So we have both our state uh, assistance and then we also have the federal program, which has just gotten going right now. And they're, they're um, working on supporting grants, again, with these small kind of community grant size um, programs to support folks. 
Um, now, I, I know that some people think about uh, air quality when they hear of wood. Um, I burn wood myself, and, um, and it's something that's always on my mind. Um, a lot of times what we're dealing with is people who are stuck, <laughs> um, and there's, there's not another solution out there um, for heat. Um, and in those sorts of situations, we're talking about lots of trade-offs. Um, and so some um, uh, social, um, social research that was done by Clarice Hart at Harvard Forest and um, Rick Harper at UMass around the country just surveying uh, folks in rural communities who are using wood and wood banks. You know, some of the alternatives are breaking up your cabinets and burning painted wood in your wood stove to keep warm because you don't have anything else. Um, so when we're talking about those kind of trade-offs, um, the idea that we're providing a wood product that's dry and readily available in the middle of winter for crisis assistance um, makes a lot of sense. And really what, where wood banks work really well is when we are paired with you know, other um, entities that are doing wood stove change-outs and getting the best emission controls into, into the systems as well and doing some um, demand management in terms of, of loading. Um, and there's a lot of great examples from other places in the country that, that are doing that, whether that's out in the Southwest or um, in the Midwest. Um, so it's a really um, good program that we, we've worked on and I'm happy to support it and see how things grow in, in the Northern Berkshires and happy to continue the conversation about um, using wood in a way that's respectful and, uh, and useful. Um, the one thing I, I will say is that because we've created these homes for wood to go to, um, we get all the challenges that comes from a lot of different sizes of material. So at wood bank, sometimes um, we have to have a lot more tools <laughs> um, than you would have in a commercial operation because you're optimized for a certain size of tree. In a wood bank, we, we process everything. Um, and so that comes with some, some added cost and added, um, and added challenges that um, you know, we put up with. Um, and we put up with it because we have the support uh, to do that. Um, and hopefully we can find a way to, to use more of the material in, in the best application. So sometimes in wood banks, we do see something that would be a, an amazing saw log come into the wood bank. And if there are opportunities to get that into uh, housing or to get that into um, an artistic project or cultural project, um, I'm all ears for learning how to do that. Um, because certainly, you know, my heart loves to see when we take a saw log and, and put it to its intended purpose. Um, so um, I'm really excited to, for this, learning more about the discussion and seeing what we have uh, to come up with here and happy to help uh, where I can. Great, thank you, Sean. All right, and our next panelist um, will be Jay Healy from Hall Tavern Farm. Um, Jay, if you can unmute yourself and take it away. Do we have Jay? <laughs> see him here, but don't see his face yet. <laughs> I was here. I don't know what there happened. <laughs> Am I here now? You, yes, we can hear you, but not okay. see you. But I apologize. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize for my technological uh, weaknesses, which are, are many. Uh, the main role I have in this discussion is a manager of a about a 300 acre tree farm where we take our material from the woods with a good management plan and, and try to turn it into other uh, wood products that are uh, compatible with uh, carbon sequestration and the local economy and creating a few local jobs in the process. Um, a couple of initial comments I have is there has been a lot of discussion of chips and um, I know some of the bigger mills around do a lot of wood chipping, and, uh, uh, but uh, the people we deal with, as well as our mill, our, our uh, mill um, chipping, it's very loud, the machine, it's very expensive, need to fix it. It's one thing that we can't reach and trying to balance 
uh, doing a good job in our woods as well as just not uh, falling apart and not being able to have a business. So we don't chip our wood. We'd love to do it, but it's something that's beyond uh, the reach of our, uh, uh, of our economic scale. Um, the other thing we're dealing with that, that's sort of not been mentioned or maybe defined uh, out of being a problem is um, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, reference to the emerald ash borer, uh, some of our large pines get the silvery sort of uh, a needle a disease that will slowly uh, turn those into a, um, a product that rots. Uh, we have red rot in terms of some of our materials. So we have a lot of uh, pests that are invading our forests. So we're trying to deal with a, how to best do, deal with them. And... Uh, we uh, have had the most success, uh, obviously sort of letting them rot, uh, not only an eyesore, but I've seen uh, uh, reports that show that this stuff turns into methane and methane is really a, a nasty problem, even compared to uh, CO2 loss that the uh, exponentially uh, more uh, uh, offensive to our environment to have methane being emitted from these products than it would be if we uh, if they just uh, uh, were dealing with straight uh, CO2. Um, so I would say on our operation, uh, 30 to 50 percent of what we deal with is salvages because a windstorm will come through, a uh, you'll have an ice storm as we've had, and uh, there could be uh, fairly large concentrations of, of uh, pine or some other products that are going to uh, eventually rot and fall down because of environmental uh, either weather exigencies or uh, from invasive uh, pests or whatever, uh, especially the woolly adelgid hemlock around here is really uh, becoming almost a uh, a non-usable product, given the, the fact of what happens when the a gel to, uh, delgid comes in and affects these woods. So what do you do with them? Well, one of our concentrations is if we can salvage uh, this material before, usually if it's a windstorm or something, you've you got two or three months, uh, maybe a shorter time in the summer, but you've got some time to harvest this material and, and put it into a house to make a beam out of it, to make some boards out of it, to make some siding out of it, something that will store that material in carbon for the life of a house, which could be, you know, 75, 80 years. Uh, and so to us, in terms of both the economics and the environmental benefit, uh, we really scurry around uh, to try to get material that would otherwise rot and turn it into a, a product that's going to store that carbon for an awful lot longer than it would be if it solely fell down in the forest and rotted. Um, we have looked at a wood bank. We'd like to do a wood bank, possibly. It's not as good a solution for us uh, as it is to try to salvage existing wood that goes into a house uh, because of some of the pluses and minuses uh, uh, in terms of burning wood, uh, uh, we'd like to think maybe that this can be a, a s solved eventually with uh, catalytic converters or uh, uh, hopefully that's part of the strategy on this is to get the best technological solutions to uh, wood if it has to be burned. Um, I think that's better than letting it rot, but it'd be nice to have some technology and some breakthroughs that might be able to be done to really reduce uh, emissions and some of the issues involved with that. Um, so those are the two main issues that I wanted to, to point out. Um, uh, we don't see much chipping going on. We see a lot of firewood trucks that go by, log trucks go by. Uh, often these logs are going up to Canada. Uh, only 2% of the material that's uh, uh, found here in Massachusetts in terms of trees is actually utilized here, uh, which seems to 
those of us, uh, everybody ought to be interested in the economy and job creation, but why we send all this material up to Canada to have them add the value and create the jobs uh, where our local uh, economies often suffer is beyond me. So, so that's what we're re really focusing on is utilizing the resource as best we can. Yes, we do have byproducts, but not very many of them. Uh, sawdust, uh, okay, people use, they need sawdust for their cows or their chickens or whatever. So uh, we can move that. We do have a few slabs, not too many, because we saw very carefully and try to minimize the amount of waste that comes out of a log if we do saw it. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that goes to people. They do burn that and, or maple sugar or make, make, uh, uh, make uh, maple or whatever. Uh, so uh, uh, my, my two pleas really are one is to uh, um, have, uh, have a thrust in terms of, uh, of working really hard on a technology that would really help with this, uh, pardon the pun, this burning issue of whether we should burn wood or not. It's certainly a ton of it is burned now, but if we could move ahead in terms of technologies and provide incentives for those that would, uh, would be uh, helpful to minimize this environmental issue, that would be positive. The other thing that would be very positive would be to have some look-see at the state's forest management plans and really provide some incentives for uh, uh, working in a positive way for carbon sequestration or managing our woods in the very best way uh, for improving the environment. We know our 300 acres is helpful for a whole variety of issues in terms of water and soil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's little discussion of how we can manage or should manage or provide incentives to, to deal with some of these uh, residue and waste issues uh, uh, in, a, in a management plan. And I think that's an opportunity for the state to take a look at. Uh, as I said before, we, we are interested in the wood bank. We did, uh, did buy a, uh, a firewood processor, but it's difficult. You need to get new equipment or equipment for trucking and, and moving stuff around. Um, and we've talked to five or six people around in the local churches and others to see if we could make it a community-based event and a volunteer kind of an operation. And everybody so far has said they're too busy. They don't have the time for it. So it's something we'd like to do, but once again, it's not as high a priority is some of these other things that we think might align with uh, uh, carbon sequestration and climate change and some of these more global issues that we're dealing with uh, on our 300 acres to be uh, positive rather than negative citizens in this world of wood. Thank you. I'm, I, I know I can spend more time, but it's, some of these gone over and I, I don't wanna bore people, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jay. All right. And our final panelist um, will be Emily Boss from the Mass Woodlands Institute. So go ahead, Emily. Hi there, everyone. I'm really grateful for this gathering and um, thank um, the Woodlands Partnership for putting it together and also all the other panelists for um, the thoughtful research that Ben did. Um, and um, the really important um, contribution that Andre makes. And I'm really grateful to have your voice here and for, for all of what you shared, Andre, and also to help us bridge and make more connections so that we can um, make sure that um, indigenous voices are at the table at the beginning. Um, and um, uh, I'm grateful too for um, Sean's uh, sharing about the Wood Bank program um, so that we can be thoughtful and uh, see ways that we can help community members that are in need. Um, it's important part of the conversation. And Jay's perspective as a sawmill owner um, and, and land steward, um, his family has stewarded the land for many years, uh, is helpful for us to be able to understand the, the challenges that people who are, um, uh, are watching over the land and, and stewarding it have every day. 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, another way of looking at woodlands and, and interacting with them. Um, uh, woodlands not only provide wildlife habitat, um, connection with the land, clean water and air, and beautiful and practical wood products like furniture and homes, uh, but they can also be a place to cultivate food, medicines, crafts and decorations. Um, Lisa mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that the Mass Woodlands Institute does is has a, a website online. I'll just share that link. Um, now it's called Western Mass Woods. And this is, this is a place um, where we put together information where you can connect with um, businesses like Jay's and, and others that um, work with wood from our local area. Um, that's something that people often ask if they're working on their home or, or renovations. And um, uh, we hope to improve this over time and to help make it more responsive to all the community's needs. Um, so I encourage you also to reach out to us to let us know if there's other aspects that would be useful that you'd like to see on it. Um, and then also I'm gonna just talk very briefly about um, cult uh, uh, woodland mushroom cultivation. And I've put together just a, a little research um, uh, uh, brief that has some information about um, cultivation and also a couple of studies that have been done. So those are in the chat for you to refer to. Um, sometimes we talk about um, uh, things that come from the woods as understory crops. Um, understory crops are non-timber products that come from the woods. Um, in 2008, MWI conducted a feasibility study on understory crops, um, one of which was cultivated edible mushrooms. Um, edible mushrooms can be grown in logs, in wood chips, or in mulch substrates like straw and manure. Um, they can be enjoyed and eaten by the grower or sold directly or through farm markets, retail stores. Um, many grocery stores in our area um, work with local producers to sell um, mushrooms. Um, and I'm not, and in this particular case, not talking about wildcraft and mushrooms, but ones that are cultivated so that you would. Um, uh, provide a spore um, and grow it in a way that's controlled um, uh, as, a, as a crop or, or for your enjoyment. Um, commonly cultivated mushrooms for sale and consumption are shiitake, uh, lentinula edodes, um, oyster mushrooms, um, lion's mane, um, wine cat mushrooms, um, uh, almond agaricus, and naomeko. Um, only shiitake um, can be cultivated for commercial production out of doors. Um, the others are typically grown indoors for reliable commercial fruiting and outdoors for eating or occasional production. Um, a variety of woods can be used. Um, shiitake grows on oak, sugar maple, beech birch, and other woods um, on bolts or cut lengths of a log. Oyster mushrooms um, like to grow on poplar, tulip poplar, willow, and elder. They can grow on bolts or, or stumps in the ground. Um, wine cap can be cultivated on mixed hardwood chips and are sometimes grown in beds in the garden. Uh, according to a market study funded by the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture for Research and um, uh, Education in 2014, um, which spoke with 57 forest grown shiitake mushroom producers in our region. Um, and at that time, an average retail value was about $16 a pound. Um, the producers reported an average of $5,637 income per year producing the mushrooms. Um, the link that I shared was a, a list of some resources to learn more about wood cultivated mushrooms. Um, there's a link to the MWI reports as well as the SAIR report uh, and places to get spore and equipment for cultivation as well. Um, there are many ways that we can work with our land to enjoy the outdoors, to engage with the woodlands, um, and to create business endeavors that help support our rural communities. So I hope you enjoy reading about these mushrooms and consider all of the various ways we can learn to connect with the woodlands around us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emily. All right. So thanks to all of our panelists for sharing um, your perspectives and information. And I'm going to turn it over now to Henry Art, who is the chair of the Woodlands Partnership Board, and he's going to lead a discussion amongst the panelists. Yes, I, I first want to thank the, the panelists for uh, just a wonderful series of presentations, the diversity of perspectives, uh, 
the issues that you have brought up that all kind of interlock and interlink with each other uh, is uh, is remarkable. And I think the uh, this is reflected in the chat that has been going on that I've been uh, trying to monitor, <laughs> uh, which is lively and uh, again, diversity of opinions uh, as to whether uh, the utilization of what we might call a residue, uh, how is that done? And certainly uh, combustion seems to be the biggest issue. Uh, but before uh, we get into that, I, I also wanted to thank uh, the, the staff of NEF, uh, who is the administrative agents uh, for the uh, Woodlands Partnership of Northwest Massachusetts, uh, Lisa and Sophie, uh, to recognize the work that Kate Conlon has done in organizing this whole panel, and, uh, and especially uh, the work of Ben uh, Carger uh, that really was bringing together a lot of information that hadn't been uh, uh, known. I mean, it, we're starting from uh, kind of square one in all of this. Uh, and uh, I hope parenthetically that the uh, not only is the video made available, but that there is a archiving and perhaps a publishing of the, the uh, chat, because I think it has been, it brings out the issues that are on people's minds. And I will try to uh, uh, kind of distill some of those questions and put them for, forward to the uh, panel uh, to discuss amongst themselves. So if you have a question uh, that you would like uh, addressed uh, that hasn't been answered already within the chat, uh, please put it forward. Uh, and just uh, to start out with, before I ask the questions, I wanted to recognize uh, Charlie Carey, who uh, was really the uh, first instigator of the Woodlands Partnership looking at this whole issue. Uh, he had contacted me now about two years ago, or maybe two and a half or three, uh, asking the question of, did we know within uh, the 21 communities uh, that comprise the Woodlands Partnership geography, uh, how much wood material wasn't flowing through the uh, normal channels of timber harvesting or even firewood uh, cutting. And that would have been kind of registered by the uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, Bureau of Forest Fire uh, and Forestry. And I said, well, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, and then through discussions with Charlie, uh, we ended up formulating a, an opportunity at Williams College to have uh, Ben uh, undertake a, a summer research project, uh, which was done uh, exquisitely. Uh, so I would like to actually recognize Charlie, and if uh, he can be unmuted, and I don't know whether he uh, would like to have be on camera or just be uh, a disembodied voice, but uh, ask Charlie for uh, a short comment uh, and whether he has any questions that he would like to pose uh, to the uh, this group of wonderful experts that we have assembled. Well, am I am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Amazing. Well, thank you ever so much, Henry, for um, giving me this opportunity. I was just actually writing a, writing a question. Is that there are. There's also wood residue coming from the forest products industry that makes products out of wood. Wood crating, wood pallets, truss manufacturers, furniture plants, housing construction, and other wood product plants all make wood residue. This wood is often dried and makes great wood fuel. Why aren't we doing more research into the emissions coming from this material as fuel as burning this material keeps carbon in the ground and stimulates local economies. Now, uh, the state of Massachusetts did a, uh, started to do this research into modern wood heat um, a couple of years ago, several years ago now, three or four years ago. Um, and then uh, COVID came along and, and 
the research money went elsewhere. But um, there seems to be a great deal of um, uh, controversy about the emissions from burning wood. Uh, and it seems to me that um, simple science, what, what emissions are coming from oil, what emissions are coming from modern wood heat. Um, and given the fact we're trying to keep carbon in the ground, um, it seems like we've got wood out of the forest already. It's a residue um, that can bring that we can bring value to as a fuel in a local community and keep dollars in local communities and stimulate local economies. So I, I, I have a website, woodenergyrecyclers.com, that is trying to organize wood residue producers because at the moment. Um, wood residue is um, produced very diversely around our economy and is treated individually um, uh, as opposed to in the aggregate. And wood is, 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 is our cleanest waste. And it seems to me if we're gonna burn waste, we ought to burn our cleanest waste first. Thank you for the opportunity to say that. Would any of the uh, panelists like to respond to uh, Charlie's statement? Seeing nobody jumping up and down, let me uh, just ask, a, a, oh, Jay. It's like Jay is his hand raised. Jay, go ahead, Jay. Uh, you're muted. You're going to have to unmute yourself. No, you, your audio. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, great. I, I, I'd like to second what Charlie has to say. I mean, there's all these options are not great for some of these alternatives. We talk about maybe uh, wood heat, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what I was alluding to in terms of research and technology and science. It's beyond my pay grade, but it seems to me given the amount of this material. And the other, the other aspect we haven't talked to from forest management, Sean might know this stat, but, but the last time I read something like, you know, a huge amount of wood in Massachusetts is junk wood, that if it was removed or there was a market for it, there would be much better saw timber growth, much higher quality of what remains. And it seems to me that's an important economic uh, effect of this. And if we, if we could improve the technology and lower the decibel level in terms of people who are adamantly opposed to this, it would have great effect in terms of positive aspects of growing the best trees uh, uh, around. And people don't realize that, but people have come to our mill from foreign sources because they really like the red oak because the red oak grows pretty slowly and has a beautiful grain pattern. Uh, they like the white pines. We have a tremendous quality uh, of wood that's grown here. And if we can improve that and kill two birds with one stone, that, that's a real pro positive. And I think Charlie's definitely on the right track of talking about research and development that might be able uh, to lower the, the level of of angst over what is or isn't uh, uh, created by, by burning wood. Ben, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, I wouldn't, I would add that it, it might not necessarily be research because I think as um, Jonathan's been putting in the chat um, so eloquently, um, there is research about wood burning um, and clearly wood burning you know, can be bad if it's not done well. Um, but the advances to wood burning that we can make are in burning it better and really returning it as, you know, just if we can burn it better, we can make this this use even more clean, um, right? So we're, we're not, we have to consider that with electricity. So, you know, air, air source heat pumps, um, a lot of that electricity is coming from um, from say solar, so we might need some some land clearing uh, for solar. So there's some other drawbacks. There are, you know, you might want to have it some you need, you need transmission lines. 
um, for solar. And then as well, you need uh, a, lot, a lot of this, this, this power comes from trash burning. So, um, so if, if we, if we see electricity as a, as a clean source, um, well, well, trash incineration, you know, I don't think we can say that trash incineration is much cleaner than wood burning. So I think a lot of it comes down to just getting back to wood burning as what it is. And that's, um, wood, it would waste if it, if it has to go somewhere and we have to dispose of it, especially, um, that's a great place to start. Um, and, uh, we have to re consider again, that, that wood chips are stored solar energy. Um, so, so I think absolutely that the, the heating makes sense. Um, but maybe not as much as the research that we have to, to improve on. It's, it's really getting, um what we're saying um to make to make sense to make people see that it's not we're not trying to say uh you know go out and burn trees and just, just burn them down but but rather that you know we have wood that we have to do something with and that if we can find ways to burn it cleaner uh, or if we can really put incentives behind burning it cleaner um not so much finding the ways just as incentives to to burn it cleaner um that really makes sense Okay, there seems to be a real uh, difference of opinion and butting of heads that is going on in terms of combusting uh, wood uh, versus uh, not combusting wood and finding other products uh, that we can can do something with, whether it's oriented strand board, uh, artificial uh, timbers. Uh, whatever with this material. Uh, is it indeed practical to think that, that under the current technology uh, that the economics of using that uh, material uh, as in effect a, a sequestered carbon source for a long period of time uh, in kind of artificially manufactured wood products that aren't just uh, uh, saw logs, uh, timbers, framing material, et cetera. Is that an economic uh, viable approach uh, as an alternative to combustion? And I throw that out to the panel to, yep. to try to, to deal with. Sorry, just maybe like right before, just, just quickly before, I know Sean, you've had your hand up, um, that, uh, you know, as Jonathan just put it in the chat, actually, a lot of this, this wood has to be chipped right away um to get it moved um if we can find ways you know if we have you know full trees that are down absolutely um you know that makes sense for for wood banks um to get the board wood but but if it has to go somewhere and if it's got tons of bark in it um because it's just a lot of like like leaves and twigs and 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 so and and, and that stuff um we find that the the wood chips really are not a high quality and there's not as we looked, um, we spoke with, you know, we, we found, we saw several, several different sources, um, engineered wood products and wood insulation are, they want, you know, they, they want that perfect, the one species, um, tree of perfectly, you know, they, they want to chip their own, their own wood chips and they're not just using, um, you know, any ar arborists wood chips, um, you know, they, it, it, there's a lot of vetting that you need to go through to get any engineered wood product, maybe less with insulation, but we're not really finding that just any kind of downed wood that's been chipped, the tops have been chipped, can be used for, for insulation or anything any in any time, anytime soon. Okay. Uh, and I, I'd like to uh, take some of the comments that have been coming out and uh, direct them back to start with Sean, but others can join in. Uh, in terms of the trade-off of burning wood uh, in a, a wood stove versus uh, displacing that with fossil fuels, uh, whether that is uh, how that comes out and, and perhaps also talk about uh, you mentioned the uh, availability of alternatives for people who uh, are fuel uh, uh, deficient and uh, 
whether you could talk about that trade-off. Sure. Um, just adding to the discussion, um, because there's a lot of conversation here, um, I'm happy to answer uh, the trade-off questions. I just want everyone to remember, too, the wood that we're talking about here, most of it is, is generated because we need to deliver reliable electricity to heat someone's house, or we need to deliver goods and services to people versus, you know, safe roads to use. Um, so that's that's driving the production of the material. And then we're really thinking about what can you do with that material elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the trade-off between uh, wood versus fossil fuel uh, now is, it's not really a conversation anymore because we just can't put any more fossil fuel into the air. Uh, uh, that's that's pretty clear from from uh, the scientists that I've talked to and the trainings that we've received, and it's the reason why we have Executive Order uh, 594 at, at the Commonwealth. So we are on a path to transition to net zero by uh, 2050, which means we are in the process of replacing our vehicle, our internal combustion vehicles with electric vehicles. We are in the process of reducing our oil consumption over the next five years to like by 95%. Um, and in a lot of places we're doing that with electricity and trying to do solar. And uh, there's a lot of places where there's still an opportunity in a market for wood um, because it's really difficult to do that work um, with a heat pump. Um, and, and something that I'm involved with at, at DCR is you know, a lot of our cultural facilities uh, difficult to, to run through a refrigerant line. Boy. Um, so um, in terms of, of um, some other things I want to think about, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, burning wood. It's a lot of my life. Um, but I just want to talk about um, wood products and, and I think a really wonderful opportunity here. The two kind of things from, from a prompt that Lisa gave me is that thinking about, uh, you know, what are the societal benefits fits of wood, and I think it's kind of the two key ones that come to mind for me right now are obviously energy, um, but the other one is housing. And I think one of the things I really want to get people excited about here and thinking about is how do we use this resource, which I may think of as a waste product, but let's think of it as, as a resource, and how do we use that to address, you know, housing and building with products that support local economies. And so thinking about that, and a lot of that comes down to to Jay's point is the quality of the tree needs to start improving. Um, and that means long-term care for trees. It's not just about planting that tree or that tree getting planted, but that, that stewardship of a tree over time to grow something that is a high quality product that isn't turned into chips and tried to glue back together to make something. Um, because it's a lot easier to make something out of a board than it is to make it out of an OSB product or a chipped product. And, you know, on the technology side, it is possible to make OSB very simply um, with hand labor. I would argue that the working conditions that those people are under to make that is not very pleasant. <laughs> um, so the solution, I think, is that we need to understand where things are scalable and not. And a lot of, what you know, commodity products are done at a large scale and they're done by machines. As as the technology advances and the cost of producing those gets better, well, then it's the, the conversation changes, but it's something to think about and one where working back to that investment in improving the quality of the trees is really important because it's just a lot easier to pay someone to go out there with a hand pole pruner to go prune that tree so that we have a high quality piece of wood. And we do that for, you know, a rotational, you know, 25 year rotation or something like that of caring for that tree. You're eliminating those three inch knots and getting a high quality board as opposed to trying to make an OSB product of it and trying to make that somewhat economically feasible. Cause it's a lot more economically feasible to pay the cost premium on producing a, a board here um, and we saw that during the pandemic when the price of lumber rose, it was, it was possible for mills in Massachusetts to make commodity lumber products because they could compete on cost. Um, and it wasn't that big of a difference in price um, to, to get people using local wood. Um, so if we can figure out ways to create those incentives, I think that's really important. Um, 
on on the burning wood just really quick because again we can't get away from it i think one of the things about emissions controls is really important is to really understand how the clean air act works and one of the things that happens with wood stoves is that you know development of clean air technology for power plants has been going on for a long time development of clean air technology for wood burning of at a wood stove has not been going on for that long and innovation and care about that that um, policy process has been even shorter timeline. So every five years in new source performance standards, we review and the top 10 um, performing pieces of equipment become the new standard for emissions controls. So we haven't had that many cycles of the wood stove um, emissions control since the 1990 to now. And the 2020, um, equipment is so much better than the 1990 equipment that it's worth thinking about. The problem is the incentives, at least at the state side, are no longer there. So the equipment's way better, but are people going to be able to access that equipment? It's going to be a much harder time because their incentive package has gone away. Now, the federal incentives are there, but really, if you want to move the needle on it, you need state, state federal, and local incentives all working together to be able to make sure that people are, yes, getting rid of those pre-1990 stoves, but we really want them to get rid of those 1990 to 2000 stoves that have um, some loopholes within their emission control technologies that can get cleaned up and make sure that we're getting the best technology out there. Um, and really that's because everyone is responsible for taking care of their air and the air of their neighbors. So those are my thoughts on that. Very good, thank you. Well, we're getting down to the last seven minutes, and I'd like to give the panelists uh, a chance to be put on the spot, as it were, uh, and share with us any thoughts that they might have on what the Woodlands Partnership of Northwest Massachusetts should do, uh, what our next steps should be uh, to try to uh, I won't say resolve these issues, but to uh, make better use, uh, to make more sustainable our approach to uh, these wood residues that have to go somewhere. Uh, and you, what should we be involved with? In? You know, Sean has just mentioned the, the state incentives for uh, cleaner uh, domestic wood stove uh, combustion uh, and the like. And, I've noticed that these little external uh, wood boilers uh, that seem to be popping up all over the place uh, seem to have very little in the way of pollution control devices on them uh, and maybe you know, sponsoring legislation or sponsoring research. What kind of information should we be gathering? So without me rambling on, I'd like to uh, allow our panel to uh, give some direction some suggestions to the Woodland Partnership of where you think we should be going on this topic. So anybody wanna start, go right ahead. Emily. I'll jump in. Um, there's been a lot of great conversation in the chat and with the panelists talking about incentives and trying to get uh, to cleaner use of wood if, if it's going to be burned. And I think that's a, a great uh, area for the Woodlands Partnership to focus their energy. Um, uh, as you said, Henry, um, legislation, but participating in the conversation and also getting um, assistance for people to be able to do the best thing, um, given whatever their constraints are financially or, or otherwise. Um, so I think that would be a great play, direction to head. Um, something that Andre had mentioned, I'm sorry, he couldn't stay on here, um, but I, I think it'd be wonderful to be able to continue incorporating his input, input of uh, indigenous tribes in the area, um, and maybe there can be connections. Um, uh, part of the, 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 the discussion is about that it's a challenge to deal with this wood that can't go anywhere else, or that needs to be moved. And that's a distinction I just wanted to make sure that we emphasize there's a lot of wood that um, fits these you know, technical specifications that in, when wood is harvested in the, the forests that should stay on the ground. That is really critically important for wildlife habitat and for soil um, you know, that has all of these incredibly necessary functions. We're not talking about that wood. We're, we're talking about wood that is um, it, it, because of our system really 
is can't stay where it is. And um, and then also, you know, to think about that. So what is that? How can we how can we keep working with the woods to be able to allow there to be um, uh, flexibility? Um, and um, yeah, so I think those are a couple of good directions that have come out of this conversation that I hope that the Women's Partnership could support um, conversations with indigenous communities. There's If there's a desire for this wood and there's a real value, um, then that's something that would be really um, important to follow up on. Anybody else? Do we have uh, Andre still with us, or did he have to? Log Andre out? had to depart, so okay. Um, but we we can be following up and stay in touch. <clears throat> Jay has his hand up now. Jay, oh, you need to un unmute your audio. This keeps switching on me. Uh, I mentioned it, I mentioned this before, but I also wouldn't forget a, a good tool that. Uh, the state has, which are forest management plans that we, we all have to work according to the rules with the forest management plans. And it'd be good to take a look at those and see if they match with some of the things we're trying to do with environmentally sound wood management in our forest. Uh, some of the work that's done is really good. Some of it's done as a makes you uh, turn the other way and be disgusted that this could happen in Massachusetts. And I think that's something that might be built along with incentives to, to give a push to uh, doing a little better in this area. Yeah, I, I might just parenthetically uh, point out that at our uh, full board meeting that we had earlier in the week, uh, the, we had the representatives from the uh, state forestry uh, division, and they pointed out that under chapter 61, which is this uh, use taxation program, uh, which people file uh, woodland, woodland management plans, uh, that carbon sequestration and management of forest lands for maximizing or optimizing uh, carbon sequestration is now a component of Chapter 61, and that uh, previously filed uh, woodland management plans can be amended and updated. And when they are renewed, that's an opportunity to to look at you know at managing your forest not for uh, maximizing or even optimizing timber harvest, but to uh, optimize a forest uh, serving as a, a carbon sink. And uh, so that opportunity now is available. 20 years ago, it was not available within the Commonwealth, but uh, there is an opportunity for people to, to take action on forest lands that they, they own and have enrolled in that program. Any other comments that the uh, panelists would like to uh, make before we depart and Ben? Yeah, just just like just super quick. Um, I did speak with Fletcher Clark Clark of Mass Wildlife, um, and so as with eyes on Bullock, Bullock's Ledge in Williamstown, where where white pine had to be actually removed uh, in order to species conservation work. Um, we might see more and more of these thing of these similar projects occurring. So again, another another you know source of wood that that comes from the forests, and that as we want to do forest management for maybe species conservation, that we're going to be generating a lot of this kind of this wood, and and in these situations that might be because you we might be able to get. A certain species of, of tree in a certain area that might be a, a situation in which we might be able to have possibly more sequestration um possibilities mm -hmm. because we know exactly what kind of tree we have in an area but that's really more the exception than the rule of where um, waste is being produced generally okay well, let me turn it over to uh, Lisa to close the proceedings. And uh, again, thank all the panelists. Thank all those many people who have uh, joined 
the the chat, the conversation, and have uh, seen the program uh, today. And uh, we will be, uh, uh, the program's being recorded and will be on our website uh, of the Woodlands Partnership of uh, Northwest Massachusetts uh, in the near future. So uh, Sophie, uh, Sophie. Here. Thank you. Thank you're you, Hank. You're not Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Sorry. here. Um, I was just going to revisit briefly. There were a couple of questions in the Q&A um, about best practices for highway management. So um, that's something else that, you know, the partnership might keep in mind. And then another question about being diligent about or, or comment about not moving or spreading disease and pests. So again, related to best management practices that we can um, hopefully keep in mind. Um, but thanks again to all of our panelists and everyone who is able to join today. Um, we will follow up with a link to some resources and the recording, and we really appreciate all your time and participation today. Thanks a lot. Take care. <clears throat>